All right. So um, this video is for the educational software design class, and it's going to be on this Sprint 3 Week 2, where I'm going to focus on those middle managers and the bubble sort uh, prototype. <clears throat> so the previous week, a bunch of readings. Like, this is it for the class. Uh, these were the last few chapters that I thought had a lot of information that would be useful um, as you move into your final stage of prototyping. One, design, prototyping, construction. Um, and it traditionally, you kind of go through an, uh, an analog process of uh, making prototypes with paper and cards. And that's the fastest way to test out your ideas before you do a digital. You're kind of skipping that and just doing digital prototyping. Uh, but just know that um, there are stages that are, are, are faster, earlier prototyping, uh, low fidelity or, or analog. And then how to evaluate, like what questions are you looking to answer? How do you evaluate if your design is good or not? If the prototyping, you know, uh, offers a solution to these problems that you're looking for. And then just some basic visual design, um, composition, placing things, uh, where to draw the eye, uh, very basic stuff. It's not like it's a, a design school class, um, but you just need some basics. It's basically, it's good information. Um, that you're going to use for just laying out user interfaces, wh whether you're into games or just regular programming. You just need some basic visual design principles just to handle user interfaces. And um, and so now I'm going to focus going back into the project, the sort project. I'm going to talk about that mid-tier um, game managers, what they're doing. And then next week, I'll put up a video on the micro interactions, the buttons, the containers. Um, so let's get started at the higher level. So I think um, if if that's gonna, I'm gonna save the containers um, for next week. Let's move forward. Let's try the, the table and then the tray, and let's see how long the video is at that point. But in any case, uh, remember I was focusing mostly on this level script, level manager. And it's basically controlling the whole flow of the experience, both the tutorial and level one, through all these state changes um, that we're going through. Um, so basically, the essence is we move through our enumeration and all these having to do with the, the introduction and this dealing with level one. Um, in the intro, mostly is dealing with UI updates in the tray um, area and turning a button on and off. Um, and then, yeah, later on the containers turn on and the, and the tray opens up. So the table um, is one of these mid-tier um, interaction points. Now it's just a, um, the way I organized the hierarchy, the, the level, is um, thinking about the the objects and how they place each other. So usually I'll look at the left-hand side when I'm building out these type of game objects, these meta objects, um, and I'm not really thinking about the coding structure. I'm looking at more like the physical structure. Um, so in AR and VR and, 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 and games too, um, you'll have this element of, of physicality that you have to consider and you see that I kind of have this abstract notion of the entire level. Then I have this table, kind of everything is grouped underneath here. Um, and since everything sits on top of the table, you know, it just made more sense physically to organize stuff. So there's some ideas of like physical organization and some ideas of logical organization. The logical organization being more, more um, traditional computer science. Um, but anyway, the table just sits the, the the table script, and it wants to know what's the three D model that we're scanning uh, that we're scaling. And if I click here, the table model, it's actually just a cube. So game object three D, just a basic uh, Unity cube. Um, I just put a, like a brown material on it. It's uh, just a basic standard, and I just made a brown. You know, it's nothing, nothing crazy. It's low fidelity prototype. I turned off the collider because it's not part of the physics system. Um, 
And the only thing I was considering is how do I scale this? And that's when I was figuring out what does it mean to have a list of three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So from the tutorial to the end of task one, through a lot of just testing and iterating on the prototype, I figured I want to start with a list of three. It's the simplest list size. Two doesn't really make sense in sorting. It just with testing, three was the minimum. And then just the amount of time, I was aiming for like a 20 minute experience. We did, you know, level uh, tasks up to like a size of eight and that felt about right. Um, and so basically once I took the containers and figured out all their placement, these gizmos are kind of in the way, I'll just get rid of them. Um, if I go here and, and if you remember, these are like just my setups, just, I was just figuring out how they're going to look and the, the spacing I need between them as I swap. Once that was all figured out, I was able to say, okay, a size of three containers is about the size of this. Um, and with the tray moving side by side, we could get away with it, a table size of, what have I, I don't think this is the default table size for three. I'll take a look in a second, but the tray moves and I want a table size to support that, which probably needs to be a little bit bigger. I'm just scaling along the, looks like the X axis. Um, and then I find my largest table size. So it's second of eight, I scale it out and I say, okay, these are my numbers I need for a table of eight. And I just moved through three, uh, four, five, six, seven, eight, and I wrote down the size uh, in just that one direction that the table needs. So I built the table, scaled the whole thing, and these are my default settings. And notice this, it's 1.3 on the X, one on height on the Y, and then Z. Z is a little skinnier because tables are normally are skinny that width way uh, or depth way, whatever direction you want to think of that. I'm probably not. Yeah, height, width, and depth. You could say depth for Z in this case. In any case, what the script does is it wants to know what that table model was. And so I just showed you it. This is how we connect to it or reference it through this uh, game object variable. Um, this isn't, we're animating or we're changing parameters over time. And when you do that by code, you can do it with uh, an animator and several animations moving between them. But I found over time that it just gets very complicated. And it's better to approach animation. You saw all these elements coming together in the VR world. You can think of them as 3D user interfaces. You can think of this as we're moving from a 2D user interface to a 3D user interface and we're moving through the environment. And um, with user interfaces and um, it's stuff that moves back and forth over and over again, you're usually going to want to animate or change the parameters over time with code as opposed to an animation system. And so normally when you start with animation or changing parameters over time, you might start with animations because uh, you don't have to think of the code of it or the math of it. Um, it's more of a design process, you know, so at least you're learning, you're not learning two things at once. You're not learning how to make something look good and how to program it at the same time. You just focus on what looks good with uh, the form what it looks like statically, then the motion of it, what it looks like as you change aspects of it over time. And then as you get really comfortable with features of graphic design or what it looks like statically and motion design, what it looks like over time, you know, those uh, lessons get ingrained into you and um, you can start um, then moving your attention to, well, how do I do this programmatically? How do I do this procedurally? How, do, how can I do this with code and math? Um, and that's where I was getting with this table anyway. And that's why it's much easier to manage everything in code and to minimize stuff in these animators as much as, as, you know, as, uh, as, much as you can. So all of my movements 
our animations are done with code. And to do that, you'll use coroutines a lot. Basically, um, it's the basics of multi-threaded code in Unity. It's um, You can think of them as their own little update loops, the little loops of code that cycle off in their own little timeline, and they figure out when they're complete, and then they stop. And so for animation or changing stuff over time, you need to put it into a little loop of code because it's going to have to loop on itself until that amount of time is done, whether it's a half second or a second. But you don't want to do that in the main. Or usually you don't want to do it in the main update loop. It just gets complicated. So notice we have this tray end of scale. So the only big thing, if I minimize this, I don't even think there's others we're calling the enumerator. So basically, we have this big public method, set listener state. Yeah, it's inheriting from the listener class. It's going to be sent in a bubble sort state, and that's where we're our current state or the current the state that we're moving to. So, um, and then we check. We're in a massive switch statement, and we check if we're moving into so if we're starting off intro to next button. Then we want the size. Oh, this is size for two containers. So I guess at the beginning of the tutorial, we start with two containers. So that kind of solves that one issue that I was thinking of, is that this table does default out to the size of two containers. So we figure out that the tray and scale, where we should end the animation, its ending scale uh, for the tray will be Remember, it's X, Y, Z, so we have to deal with vector threes. And I um, hard-coded in that we're starting at 1.3. And if you look at the table model, that's just what we're starting at, 1.3. And um, the local scale Y, we don't mess with it up and down. Uh, and we don't mess with it Z. So we're just changing what we're moving to. So this is the, the new... X scale. In this case, for two containers, it's 1.3. So since the table defaults at 1.3, um, we're going from 1.3 to 1.3. It's not doing anything, but let me shrink it down, and I'll show you that when we start, and yes, intro to next button, I'll click play. We'll notice that it does scale up to 1.3. So it just happens to be that I'm, I'm defaulting the table already at 1.3. So we're moving from 1.3 to 1.3, and it's not uh, initially this lerping or this coroutine is not going to be um, seen. But as we move into other stages or sections of the enumeration of the experience, you see that we start to introduce new values. And so it does grow over time. But I wanted to show you that it says when we move into this intro to next button or the first introduction, we're going to move to an X value of 1.3. So if I do shrink this down, say 1.4, I'll just round that and click play. Watch this number here. Over time, it goes up to 1.3 and stays. All right. So that is the coroutine running. So and let me try scaling it out. It should just kind of fall back to 1.3. Let's see. Yep, stretches back in. So there's kind of the benefit. So no matter where the starting point is, too big, it's too small, it zooms in. And the, pro the issue with animations is they're more like hard-coded. You, you can't have this type of flexibility that you have with code. So anyway, it's setting a new vector 3, putting it into this private vector 3. And then we're running a coroutine, that little separate loop, a little X different thread of code that's on its own timeline, if you can think of that. So what we're running is table transition. If I shrink this all down, here we have private enumerator, table transition. It's expecting a vector three, that's our start, a vector three, that's our end. Uh, how long, a float of how long should we be animating, four seconds. And a float for if we should be waiting. Sometimes there needs to be a pause in the beginning. Um, and right, it defaults to zero, meaning there is no pause. But if I put in this fourth parameter, we can pause for that length of time before the animation starts. So notice these two are, 
or have uh, settings. So that means I can call this function um, with these two parameters, and I don't if I don't set these two floats in my inputs, that they'll just be set to four f and zero f respectively. Or if I can set, I have to set these are mandatory. This fun, I'll call an error if I don't get these two vector threes in the, in the first two spots. But if I do designate one float, it'll be this one. Um, and then this one won't be designated, it'll be default to zero. So these have optionally can just be set to defaults if you don't choose to use them. But this is the method that all these cases are calling. Ta table transition, table transition, table transition. Actually, as I move down, see that each one is just calling that, and this is the one method that they're all calling, just with this different tray and scale. I'm just looking at these times on the right hand side. It looks like I did put in the zero apps, even though they they default um, to zero anyway, but what have you. So in this case, we're saying call this method. Um, it's an enumerator. We don't have to get into details of enumerators. Um, just know that they can enumerate. They can move through a collection. In this case, think of them as moving through the frames. So for the next four seconds of frames, we will be moving through our enumerating, and then we end. So... Uh, for each of these cases, notice that um, I'm not putting in all of the uh, bubble sort state enumerations, only the ones where I wish to change. So at the very beginning, I do wish to set it to 1.3, just in case we're moving from, um, we keep jumping back from like level one to tutorial, that at the beginning of tutorial, I know that the table Z, uh, X scale should go to 1.3. And only in this intro to three elements list zero, which is here. So we don't change anything. We change it here at the beginning, hold, 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 hold. And we then we just change it here. And again, here and here. And whenever, if you notice in the little comments, we move to size two. This is where I move to size three. We move to size three again. Um, but I did set this again because this is the transition from tutorial to level one. And so these are just like safety checks. Just like if the developer is popping back and forth and they start on bubble sort one, level one, without going through tutorial, I do want to set the table to this width to accommodate three containers. Then we have four and five and six. And again, I just measured them out once I placed the containers to figure out what these numbers are. Notice I'm just hard coding them. And at the end of the day, um, this is um, one way to start a coroutine is you call the, the method call with the, the input parameters that you wish to send in. And then you store it in this reference variable and then you pass it in to the start coroutine. And if you notice up here, here's that variable that we're using over and over again. And these are just debugs out that I'm telling to the console kind of for me to know that these transitions are happening. So this table is only growing at only the, the, the state, the enumeration of the parts of the experience that I know that there's a change in the size of the table. And I just keep testing and testing and figure out and try and break my experience of jumping around. And then when it does break, I know that, oh, I need to tell, or specifically to set the table to this size. And then um, that is this big switch with all these cases and they're calling this coroutine. And then what is this coroutine doing? Well, um, we have two vector threes that are passed in, two floats. So yield return new, wait for seconds. So however long this wait time is, we just wait and don't do anything. Yield return new. So you'll get used to these yield returns, um, but ultimately you're, uh, you'll are you get errors unless um, if you're trying to make an enumerator or a coroutine like this, you need to have that yield return somewhere in here. You do need to terminate um, this yield or execute this yield at least once for it to be an enumerator. So yield basically says just wait a frame or wait a certain amount of time. So in this case, we're, this we, we stay stuck on this line of code 
until this amount of time has passed, which in this case, no time, so we just move forward. Um, now, just to drive home the importance of this, my main code is moving down through this block of code sequentially, line by line, right? As traditional um, lines of code do. Now, the fast, or the interesting thing about a code routine is that, say we do evaluate this case to be true and we start moving through these lines of code. Um, once we actually run this code routine, our main program continues on and keeps doing whatever else it's doing while this gets executed. So it's like a branching timeline. Our main line of our main program keeps going. Think of this as uh, what they call threads are different um, lines of execution, codes of execution, programs that are running in your CPU. And it doesn't necessarily have to be on another CPU. Most computers have multi-core. What this is saying, it's multiple threads. So multiple lines of code that are executing at the same time on one processor, maybe multiple processors. But you can think of this, pro this program moving along in sequential time, and it keeps going. And it just kind of sparked out a branch right here. That is now lines of code that are executed in parallel on a separate timeline on another thread. And that's the beauty of this stuff is it just shoots off on its own timeline and that's why the, this stuff can just take care of its own time and animate, do what it needs to do in a co-routine, in a separate routine, a routine of code. So it sets this float to a lap time of zero. This, if you look up on forums or um, Stack Overflow, um, this is a standard. So you, basically you go into a while true, uh, a while loop that just keeps going. And at some situation, it, it breaks out of it. And then we're allowed to basically terminate this thread, terminate this coroutine. So while the elapsed time is less than the move time, elapsed time starts at zero, move time is four. Um, or whatever level dot reset timer. So maybe let me see what this is. Uh, I set it to two. So it's two seconds. So while well, zero is less than two, true, we go into the while loop. All right. So then we take the transform of the table model and here's the next big part. And usually it needs to be some type of lerping. Uh, lerp linear interpolation. So think of it as you put in one number, you put in another number, and you put in a um, a float from zero to one, and it figures out how far along it should be from that a number to the b number. So these are vector threes. We don't have to worry about the complicated linear algebra, vector math, and figuring out when we move from one vector to another. Um, what's the interpolation between them. But to simplify it, uh, the base, most basic one is mathf.lerp, or lerp between one float to another. So say we want to lerp from uh, the number 5 to the number 10. And so A would be 5, B would be 10, and then the time that our float T, the interpolation, if it's 0, it's going to be on point A or 5. If it's 1, we've moved fully to the second point, B, or 10. Um, and then anything in between, say T equals point 0.5, or halfway between 5 and 10 are 7 and a half. So in this case, we're saying that we're going to lerp between a vector 3, a start scale, where the table is currently at, on the X scale, well, X, Y, and Z, but only the, the X number changes. Um, and then the end scale, where that the ending scale should be. There's going to be that X part of the vector 3 is changed. And then how far along of the lerp are we? Well, elapsed time when we start is 0 over move time of 2. 
So 0 divided by 2 equals 0. We're at point A. We're at the start scale. And then elapsed time plus equals time dot delta time. So delta time is the fraction of a second that um, the amount of time that has gone from the last frame, the last update loop. So it's a small little fraction of a second. We just add that small little fraction. It's a small little decimal number. We add it to elapsed time. But elapsed time grows from zero to a small little fraction of a second. And then we do yield return null, which means for that frame, we just pause. And then the next frame happens, we evaluate the while loop because we've terminated the, well, we've gone through one cycle of it. And then we do this line again. Now, the only thing that's changed this line is the elapsed time. It's just a very, very small part of a second. So we're a little, little bit past A right now, or the start scale. And in my other example, Moving from 5 to 10, we're just a little bit past 5. Then we, whatever time has passed, we add it to elapsed time, a little bit more of a second. And we do the while loop, a little bit is still less than 2. Go through, and we've moved just a little bit. So these quick little updates, small little changes to these parameters at little fractions of a second. And then the graphics card updates on your monitor so fast that you cannot perceive the change in time, the change uh, in this discrete way, and it looks like fluid motion to your eye. So let's say we do this a lot enough where one second, we keep adding small parts of a second, we get to one. We go back up, one, less than two, evaluate, lerp from start to end, one divided by two, halfway, 0.5, halfway between start and end. That's great. We keep a new, we, and then we update the model transform scale. And then we cycle through, we cycle through, and eventually elapsed time gets closer and closer to two, where this little increment pushes it over two. So two points, so a very small amount, is going to be greater than or equal to move time, making this false, meaning we jump out of the while loop and go down to here. And the reason I'm setting the scale of the table to the end scale is that the way that this works is you'll be very, very close, you know, like 0.9999 or maybe a little bit over, but you won't be exactly equal to where you want to get to. So you want to just set it to wherever you wish to get to. We, we've, got, we've reached the, the amount of time. Let's just make sure we're precise and set our table model scale to the end scale. And then we hit this yield return null, pause till next frame, and then we're, we've terminated, we, we've reached the end of this code block, and we're done with the enumerator. Now this thing is called all these different times to move the table up and down, and, and are bigger and smaller for all these containers. So since we've talked about the containers quite a bit, I think I'm just going to talk about the containers in this video, um, and then I'll save the entire tray for the next video. So the, yeah, let me see how far I am actually, I might do another video. Yeah, I'm going to do another video for the containers.